I want to call this committee hearing to order. Um, I want to thank our witnesses today. We have uh, Lieutenant General David Ballon of the uh, Marine Corps Reserve. We have uh, Lieutenant General Jody Daniels of the Army Reserve. We have uh, General Daniel Hokinson of the uh, National Guard Bureau. We have Admiral Mustin of the Navy Reserve, and we have Lieutenant General Scobie, uh, Chief of the Air Force Reserve. Thank you all for being here, uh, and we look forward to your testimony. Uh, before I get started in my prepared statement, I want to say when you guys are up to bat, there's five of you. Uh, try to hold it to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be a part of the record. Um, I would just say this. Americans owe the National Guard and Reserve a debt of gratitude for your response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly 60,000 National Guard and Reserve service members answered the call of duty. These were historic, record-breaking mobilizations. And I want to personally say thank you to you and the dedicated men and women under your command, as well as their families. The pandemic has impacted all Americans. We all know how it has disrupted our families and our careers, with so many jobs lost and questions about how to pay the bills. Nearly 800,000 members of the Guard and Reserve have been through the same, plus deployments, both domestically and abroad. That places further strain on families and civilian employment. Senators are reminded of these sacrifices every day when we come to the work, because one of those deployments is right here at our nation's capital. This subcommittee wants to make sure that we're doing right by all Americans that serve in uniform. That means supporting them with pay and benefits that they have earned, making sure they are properly trained for their missions, providing for their mental and physical health, and ensuring that they have the equipment that they need when they're mobilized. When the President's 2022 budget arrives in the coming weeks, one of my first questions will be what it means for the well-being of our reserve components on all those fronts and more. I look forward to continuing our engagement with each, each one of the witnesses here today after the budget is provided to Congress. We want to know how that budget will support your priorities for the coming year. But as for today, I look forward for your testimony on the state of each of the reserve components, what challenges you are facing, and how this subcommittee can help. With that, I'll turn it to Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to welcome all of our witnesses today. Um, our National Guard and Reserves perform a vast and critical role in our national defense. They're called to respond to, nat they're called to, respond to national disasters, homeland security threats, and overseas contingencies are constant. Their unwavering commitment has been particularly evident over the last year as thousands have been deployed at unprecedented rates to provide medical care and administer vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to thank all of you and the men and women who carried these tasks out. I would also, uh, at this point, uh, as near peer competitors, as we realize are modernizing and developing their military capabilities at alarming rates, we want to ensure your departments receive the necessary resources to remain a ready and lethal force. I recognize that we will not receive the budget until May the 27th. And as a result, our conversations about specific funding items may be limited. But I also look forward to hearing from each of you about the ongoing efforts to sufficiently recruit, to train, and equip our reserve forces, especially in light of setbacks due to the pandemic. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling this hearing today. Thank you, Senator Shelby, and uh, we will we will start with uh, Lieutenant General David G. Bellin, uh, Commander of the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear, appear before you today and testify on behalf of the Commandant of the Marine Corps about your Marine Corps Reserve. I'm honored to appear with my fellow Reserve Component Service Chiefs and my senior enlisted advisors. Force Sergeant Major Carlos Ruiz, who sits behind me, and Force Command Master Chief Kerry Wesser. The mission of the Marine Corps Reserves is to augment, reinforce, and sustain the active component. We have reserve forces forward deployed alongside and integrated with their active counterparts, supporting numerous combatant commander requirements on a daily basis. Over the past year, 
more than 1,000 reserve Marines and sailors activated and deployed to support 20 operational requirements across six geographic combatant commands. Despite the ongoing global pandemic, the Marine Corps Reserve has continued to train, equip, and prepare for the next fight. I want to thank each of the members for your support to the Marine Corps' force design initiative over the past year. While this has necessitated the closure of our reserve tank units and bridging companies, we could not have begun our transition to a more nimble and lethal force without your assistance. I want to thank my fellow service chiefs, particularly the National Guard, for their support. They have been true partners by providing great options to our reserve Marines who elected to transition to the National Guard in lieu of continuing their service as a Marine outside the immediate region. I would also like to acknowledge Admiral Mustin and the Navy Reserve for committing to explore new ways to integrate our Navy and Marine Corps Reserve team to ensure we are best postured for the future fight. Despite the tremendous pressures and obstacles that COVID-19 has presented, I'm pleased to inform you that the morale in your Marine Corps Reserve remains high, as evidenced by the <clears throat> reserve component end strength of 99% of our total requirement. Not only are we attracting new Marines, but they are also committing to service beyond their contractual obligations. On any drill weekend, an average of 25% of the Marines standing in formation are not contractually obligated to be there. Every month, these Marines have a decision to make, and they choose to continue to serve and lead their fellow Marines and sailors. I'm always impressed by the professionalism, competence, dedication to duty, and motivation of our reserve Marines. The way they balance family responsibilities, civilian careers, and school with their military service is nothing short of extraordinary. Like their active duty brothers and sisters, they serve selflessly to protect our great nation, and they continue to answer their irrational call to serve. As Secretary Austin highlighted, our most critical asset is our people. The Marine Corps Reserve must promote and retain the very best Marines and sailors, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or background. Through the diversity of thought and action, we can find more resourceful and innovative solutions to the increasingly complex problems presented from great power competition. We are actively developing new initiatives and strategies to help achieve a more diverse and ultimately a more talented Marine Corps Reserve. We will need all Marines and sailors to contribute to solving the issues we will face and to ultimately win the next fight. I want to thank this subcommittee for your continued support to the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Appropriation. As you may recall, last year I requested your support for my effort to use NAGRIA funds to remedy the deficiencies of individual combat clothing and equipment within the Marine Corps Reserve. As ICCE becomes more expensive in the future, a more flexible NAGRIA is a key tool Congress can employ to help protect our warfighters. In closing, I want to extend my gratitude for your ongoing efforts to provide timely appropriations each year. This has a direct impact on your reserve Marines and sailors and their limited number of training days. Your continued support will help to ensure the Marine Corps Reserve will have predictable and uninterrupted training schedules to maximize personal material and training readiness. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, General. And next up, we have Lieutenant General Jody J. Daniels, uh, Army <clears throat> Reserve. There we go. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, distinguished members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the 200,000 soldiers and civilian employees of the U.S. Army Reserve, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for your continued support for our soldiers, families, and employers. In an era of great power competition, the Army needs forces able to compete with adversaries, respond to crises, win in conflict, and prepare for the future. That mission requires a dedicated Federal Reserve Force that is ready now and prepared to meet the challenges of tomorrow. That force is the United States Army Reserve. At the cost of just 6% of the total Army budget, the Army Reserve provides 20% of the total force, nearly half of the Army's maneuver support, a quarter of its force mobilization capability, and a myriad of other unique capabilities. Over the last three years, the Army Reserve has focused on rebuilding collective readiness to win near-peer, large-scale combat operations as we transform into a force capable of providing multi-domain operations. However, last year, like the rest of the world, we encountered an unforeseen threat, but our readiness paid dividends in unexpected ways. 
Within 24 hours of the president invoking involuntary mobilization authority in response to COVID-19, the Army Reserve aggregated critical medical capabilities and initiated one of the largest domestic mobilizations in our history. Within days, we assembled over 2,800 soldiers, including 1,200 healthcare professionals, and deployed them into critical crisis zones around the country. To date, over 4,500 Army Reserve soldiers have mobilized to support our nation's COVID-19 response. The Army Reserve continues to support the COVID-19 response operations by prioritizing the readiness and training of our soldiers and formations. Early in the pandemic, we focused on individual readiness and began using cloud-based tools to conduct virtual battle assemblies. We also implemented control measures to decrease risk during in-person gatherings. Despite an uncertain training environment, the Army Reserve continues to support combatant commanders. Since March 1, 2020, we have mobilized almost 18,000 soldiers <clears throat> and 268 units to support operations around the globe. We have also developed a readiness concept known as the Army Reserve Mission Force, or Arm Force, to prepare our formations for the four Cs, competition, crisis, conflict, and change. The Armed Force nests under the Army's Regionally Aligned Readiness and Modernization Model, or REARM, and provides a common sense framework to align resources across the component and unit readiness cycles. This approach ensures that we have sufficient readiness to support our combatant commands while responsibly investing in the modernization necessary for the future fight. While maintaining readiness, we are also shaping tomorrow by bringing innovation and depth to Army modernization efforts. We created the 75th Innovation Command to act as technology scouts, and we are leveraging the vast subject matter expertise gained through our civilian careers to assist Army Futures Command. However, all of this means nothing without our soldiers in our formations. We need ready and resilient soldiers, capable leaders, cohesive teams, strong families, and supportive employers to ensure our success. To that end, we are aggressively addressing behaviors that destroy our squads, Sexual assault, sexual harassment, extremism, <clears throat> and racism run counter to our Army values. We are embracing the philosophy of this is my squad to build a culture of dignity and respect and ensure all believe their lives are worth living. Sustaining critical operational capabilities requires adequate and predictable funding. We are grateful for the consistent appropriations that positively impact Army readiness and modernization efforts, meet the needs of the Army and our combatant commands, across the full, stage of full range of military operations, including support of the National Guard and Reserve Equipping Account. The future holds many challenges, but today's Army Reserve is the best trained, best equipped, and striving every day to be the most ready Army Reserve of our nation's history. With your continued support, we will continue to build on our strong foundation to meet the needs of the nation and shape the Army Reserve of tomorrow. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Daniels. Uh, General Hokanson uh, of the Guard Bureau, you're up. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's an honor for our senior enlisted advisor, Tony Whitehead, and I to join you today on behalf of the soldiers and airmen of your National Guard. Earlier this month, we reached a key milestone, the 10 millionth person vaccinated against COVID-19 by members of our National Guard. This is not only a reason for hope and relief, it's a testament to our abilities and a triumph of our partnerships. As the primary combat reserve of the Army and the Air Force, we are manned, trained, and equipped to fight our nation's wars. But in times of emergency, our people, training, and equipment help us respond to our communities. Last June, more National Guard troops were mobilized than at any time since World War II. Nearly 120,000 soldiers and airmen were deployed supporting the warfight overseas or involved in domestic operations here at home. And despite the COVID environment, we continued our military training and met every overseas deployment requirement. In January, in response to the attack on the Capitol, we mobilized and deployed 26,000 National Guardsmen to DC within two weeks. Using organic National Guard air support and logistics, soldiers and airmen from every state and territory arrived to help secure our 59th presidential inauguration. This past year was an extraordinary one for our National Guard. And in the interest of time, I'd like to highlight just one weekend, Labor Day of 2020. That weekend, while many Americans were on holiday, more than 64,000 National Guardsmen were on duty around the globe. Roughly 20,000 were deployed across 34 nations in support of our combatant commanders. During that same weekend, more than 18,000 were helping their communities fight COVID-19 
from manning testing sites to working in food banks so our fellow Americans would not go hungry. More than 3,500 were helping their communities recover from Hurricane Laura in Texas and Louisiana. More than 2,600 were supporting Customs and Border Patrol on the southwest border. More than 1,500 were protecting the rights of peaceful protesters and safeguarding communities against violence in Georgia, Texas, Kentucky, and Wisconsin. That same weekend in Alaska, a team of Guardian Angel Airmen rescued two hikers, one who fell more than 100 feet off a cliff. For their actions, they were awarded the Wilderness Rescue of the Year by the American Red Cross of Alaska. And still on that same weekend, specially modified C-130s from the California and Nevada Air National Guard, along with helicopters and unmanned aircraft from multiple states, were fighting record wildfires. This included the dramatic rescue of 240 people trapped by wildfires in the Sierra National Forest by the California National Guard's 40th Combat Aviation Brigade. This daring night rescue and heavy smoke was possible because our crews were equipped with modernized helicopters and the latest generation night vision goggles. For their heroism and extraordinary achievement, the air crews were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. This one weekend is just one of many weekends for the National Guard. Our country and our communities needed us, so our guardsmen left their families and their civilian jobs and proudly served as soldiers and airmen. Their selfless service is both important and inspiring and is reflected in our recruiting and retention. It's no surprise the National Guard was ready for the challenges we faced in 2020 and continue to face in 2021. This would not have been possible without your investments over the last 20 years that transformed the National Guard from a strategic reserve to today's operational reserve. I'm grateful for the committee's support in helping provide our soldiers and airmen the facilities, equipment, and training resources they need <clears throat> to be interoperable on the battlefield and responsive in our communities. Combined with our partnerships at every level, from local first responders to FEMA to our 82 international state partnerships, we are posturing for the future. However, there are still places we fall short. Our equipment must be deployable, sustainable, and interoperable. Our facilities must be repaired or replaced if they're no longer functional. And our full-time support must increase so we can better manage our resources and most importantly, our people. There are also distractions our soldiers and airmen face every day. If they don't have health care, what happens if they get hurt or injured after they come off orders? If they're doing the same job as their active or reserve counterparts, why are they treated differently? If they've invested their career in the space mission, will there still be a home for them and the National Guard? Every day our team is working to address these issues, and there are solutions, and I'm committed to working with the Army and the Air Force and you to find them. Among my most pressing concerns are premium free health care for guardsmen, the establishment of a space National Guard, and elevating six of our general officers commensurate to the levels of their responsibility. These are strategically important issues, and they are the right thing to do. The National Guard is about 20% of our joint force, and anything that impacts our readiness reduces our nation's ability to deter and makes us less competitive, less capable, and less lethal. Help us keep our promise to remain always ready, always there. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Hokanson. Next up, we have Vice Admiral uh, John Mustin of the Navy Reserve. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Probably need the mic. Uh, there we are. Chairman Tester, uh, Ranking Member Shelby, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It's my distinct honor to report to you on the status and the vision of America's Navy Reserve. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize my wife, Kim, whose steadfast support through my nearly three-decade Navy career exemplifies the service and sacrifices typical of our military spouses. I'd also like to express my gratitude to Navy Reserve Force Master Chief Chris Coates, my partner and confidant, who tire tirelessly advocates for our enlisted reserve sailors every day. This is also the perfect time to publicly thank my fellow Reserve Service Chiefs for their ongoing support, counsel, collaboration, and partnership. Finally, I'd like to recognize the 109,000 sailors, our nearly 500 dedicated civilians, the families who support them, and the thousands of employers who value and enable the service of our citizen sailors worldwide. They are all equally critical stakeholders in the success of our Navy Reserve. Your Navy Reserve sailors are flexible and responsive. This past year alone, to address the coronavirus-19 pandemic, 
the Navy Reserve activated more than 7,000 sailors in direct support of the nation's emergency response. I remain humbled by their agility, capability, and their sacrifices, as well as the enduring support of their families and employers. Your reserve force is also a strategic asset, aligned with the National Defense Strategy, the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy, and the Chief of Naval Operations Navigation Plan. The Navy Reserve is at an inflection point, pivoting to develop essential strategic depth. This renewed maritime focus on integrated, all-domain naval power will address the provocative behavior we experience daily from a rising China, a resurgent Russia, and other ambitious authoritarian states who seek to disturb global norms and the rules-based international order. To this end, the singular priority of the Navy Reserve is simple, warfighting readiness. Modernization of our equipment, training systems, and mobilization processes will generate efficiencies that enhance our contribution to the total force at an attractive, resource-informed cost. To ensure our sailors are operating relevant modern equipment, procurement of the Juliet variant to replace legacy C-130 aircraft is the Navy Reserve's number one equipment priority. With an average age approaching three decades and a mission-capable rate of only 25%, the current C-130 Tango fleet is challenged to meet sustained fleet logistics requirements. With a mission-capable rate of nearly 75%, the KC-130 Juliet, on the other hand, would provide an additional $200 million per year in transportation cost savings to the Navy. Similarly, modernization of Navy Reserve high-end adversary aircraft is aligned with the Navy's divestment of legacy F-18 Hornets. Increasing Navy Reserve capability and capacity to support Navy adversary requirements will extend active component strike fighter service life while concurrently enabling the dedication of precious fleet aircraft and flight hours to the fleet-specific operational missions they were purchased to perform. The totality of Navy Reserve modernization also includes enhancing the processes and systems employed to mobilize our sailors. For example, adaptive mobilization will increase current activation capacity 15-fold while reducing the mobilization timeline by over 80%, effectively activating the entire force in 30 days. Integral to this process is the implementation of the Navy Personnel and Pay System, NP2, the single most important administrative enhancement in decades, which will become operational in January of 22. Your reserve sailors are one team. Central and vital to the generation of critical enduring advantage are our people. The Navy Reserve continues to forge a culture of excellence based on the Navy's core values, honor, courage, and commitment, and our four core attributes. We're dedicated to fostering the diverse, inclusive culture that generates our decisive warfighting advantage. They are a winning team, and they are ready. That said, delivering surge and warfighting-ready maritime forces to the total force would be impossible without your continued support. Specifically, we appreciate your support in the modernization efforts of the Reserve Maritime Patrol and Reconnaissance Capability. The acquisition of P-8 Alpha aircraft ensures the reserve, reserve Force continues to deliver necessary operational and strategic value across the fourth. Additional modernization efforts are supported by the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Account, which is vital to ensuring the readiness and lethality of reserve equipment. And ultimately, the timely delivery of a fiscal year 22 appropriations bill will provide predictability to our sailors, to their families, to their employers, and most importantly, to our global combatant commanders. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, I remain humbled every day by the commitment and contribution of our citizen sailors, our dedicated civilians, and the supporting families that collectively are your Navy Reserve. They all serve our nation with distinction every day in every theater around the globe, 24-7, 365. They are the sentinels of our security. Their readiness is neither coincidental nor guaranteed, and yet our Navy and our nation are counting on them to be ready when called. With your continued support, they will deliver proudly and capably. I thank you for your support and attention, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Admiral Munston. Um, next, we have Lieutenant General Richard Scobie, the Air Force Reserve. Well, microphone to work. I think it is. Thank you, sir. Hello, Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's an honor for me to be here today with my other service counterparts. And it's also an honor for me to represent the Airmen of the Air Force Reserve. I would normally be joined today by my senior enlisted advisor, Chief Master Sergeant Tim White, but he is supporting the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force and the Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force at their quality of life hearing uh, with the House. As a command team, the command chief and I are continually amazed at the accomplishments of our Air Force Reserve citizen airmen, despite every challenge that has put, been put in front of them over the past year. The Air Force Reserve is a cost-effective, accessible, and ready force. 
We provide strategic depth with rapid surge capability across every Air Force core mission set. We do so cost effectively because we are predominantly a part-time force and we're an accessible force, contributing globally to joint force operations every day. And finally, we are a ready force. When the nation needed rapid pandemic response, we had medical personnel on the ground in New York City and New Jersey within 48 hours of being notified. We provide strategic depth for national defense while operating on, on only 3% of the Air Force budget. We're committed to attracting top talent and fostering a culture of inclusion where every airman is valued and can thrive. With Congress's assistance, we preserve pre-pandemic gains in both individual and unit level readiness. And through things like uh, force innovations such as virtual training, we modernized key weapon systems and lessened critical manpower shortfalls. We increased our, increased our organizational effectiveness and enhanced our ability to provide excellent care for citizen airmen and their families through internal reforms and process improvements. The Air Force Reserve invests every congressionally enacted dollar for maximum return. We are grateful for the $19.5 million we received in CARES Act funding which allowed us to rapidly scale our telework capability to protect our workforce during the pandemic. We are also grateful for continued direct hire authority for critical career fields. Last year, with this authority, we significantly increased our Air Reserve Technician Pilot Manning from where it was at 75% the last time we talked to 97% today. Our requested fiscal year 22 budget will ensure the Air Force Reserve meets national defense strategy objectives and the multi-domain force that we need. We are in step with the chief of the staff of the Air Force's vision to accelerate change or lose. We are able to compete with our nation's adversaries across the spectrum of conflict, and we'll continue to do, do that by capitalizing on our readiness gains we made last year. We diligently request only those funds we can execute, the reserve personnel appropriations and operation and maintenance funds which drive our readiness. These accounts fund our training, our flying hours, mobilization requirements, our equipment maintenance, and our salaries. In particular, our flying hour and civilian pay programs have taken considerable reductions in recent years, rightfully so, due to inf insufficient justification and an overestimation of funds that we needed. We've made significant in internal strides in adjusting these accounts, and I look forward to working with you to enhance readiness and reduce risk in our fiscal year 2022 budget. I also want to thank you for enabling access to TRICARE Reserve Select. We are all on this panel in agreement that the, this major legislative accomplishment will offer affordable continuity of care for our members and their families. However, the legislation currently doesn't take effect until 2030. To improve our reserve forces quality of life and readiness, I request your support for accelerated implementation and funding of this healthcare access. One final area I would like to touch on is equipment parity. We accomplished this primarily through the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Appropriation INGRIA enables us to modernize equipment, sustain our capability, and replace obsolete, obsolete equipment to maintain parity with the active component when recapitalization is not feasible. Parity is critical to seamless total force integration, and we remain grateful for these appropriations and cannot overemphasize how vital they are to our readiness. I appreciate your support for INGRIA now and in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to be here before you today and for your steadfast support as we ensure the Air Force Reserve remains prepared to defend our great nation and the American people. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General Scobie, and I want to thank each one of you for your testimony here today. I'm going to start with you, General Hokinson. The Air Force has come under some scrutiny lately for its basing decision for the Air National Guard's C-130Js. Uh, after Congress appropriated funds for more aircraft to modernize several units, there were discussions within the Air Force to redirect some of these aircraft to a C-130 training base that was not included in the last basing decision. So the question is, will all four units, including the unit in Georgia, be fully converted to the modern C-130Js provided in last year's appropriation bill? And Chairman, my understanding in working with the Air Force is that all four of those squadrons will convert to the J model. Um, over the timeline, um, I'm not specific on the last one. It'll depend on additional purchases, but the goal is to get all four converted to J models. Okay. Uh, and, and can you tell us, uh, because this directly relates to the answer you just gave, what is the timeline for redistributing the H aircraft? 
Chairman, my understanding in working with the Air National Guard, as soon as the J models are available, that they'll start uh, moving the other, the H3 models and 2.5 to the units with the oldest C-130s so that we can retain the capability and capacity our nation needs. So, and, do, and uh, if you don't have it at your fingertips now, is it possible to get us that timeline that you said you didn't have? Chairman, absolutely. We'll take that for the record. Okay, thank you. Um, there have been discussions throughout the year, uh, mobility capabilities and requirement studies, on this total and the strength for the Air, uh, Air Force's 130 fleet. Uh, can you comment on the Air National Guard's requirements? So, Chairman, we're waiting. I know in July is when the mobilities capabilities requirements study comes out. And previously, they have not included the domestic requirements here in the United States. And so we're asking that they, they consider that because we think that that may influence the actual number of C-130s that the Air Force would retain. All right. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and so what... Uh, uh, how many um, C-130s uh, is the Air Force Reserve seeking to uh, uh, to upgrade? Uh, Chairman, right now in, in the in the Air Force Reserve, we are in good shape across the, the spectrum in our, our C-130s. What we have prioritized is, one, is upgrade of our H models in, and making sure that they're still viable going forward. And the other thing is in our special missions. And you're very familiar with our firefighting capability, our aerial spray capability, and our hurricane hunters. The hurricane hunters have already been upgraded to C-130Js, and right now we're looking at uh, between our firefighting, uh, mobile, air for, mobile fire for airborne firefighting units, and the aerial spray units to also upgrade those uh, to C-130Js. And Thank we're on the time, front, time frame to do that now with the Secretary of the Air Force. Thank you. This is a question for all of you. Um, uh, the horrific crime of sexual assault is finally getting the attention it needs uh, from this administration. Uh, and I commend Sec Secretary Austin for calling for a 30-day independent review commission. So to all of you, why is sexual assault on the rise in many of your components? Is there a difference between units or regions of the country, or, or is it a command climate issue? Senator, I first want to start by acknowledging that, uh, that the service takes sexual assault extremely seriously. We understand that our most solemn obligation is to the families and the citizens who give us the young Marines and sailors who elect to serve. And our, and our moral obligation is to provide a safe uh, environment for them to develop, not only as Marines and sailors, but also as citizens. So there, there is no course of action that Congress may suggest to increase the opportunity for safety and to increase the, the overall wellness of those Marines and sailors that we would even begin to think adversely about. So we're open to all COAs in order to get us to a better place. I, I do acknowledge that within the Marine Corps, the reporting has increased. There's several different ways to look at that, and one of that is that you know the first thing we had to do is establish credibility with the force that by reporting, they could trust the institution to do something about that. And we believe that that's part of the increase in reporting, that by no way mitigates the actual uh, uh, crimes that are being committed. So... Uh, the look on the what we're trying to do with overall health and wellness of the force, particularly with sexual assault, is to continue to educate, continue to hold accountable those transgressors, and to increase the overall safety at all bases and stations for our young people. General Daniels. Across the Army Reserve, we're seeing our numbers declining. However, that does not make us a perfect organization, as any of these numbers is just too many. So we're still tackling the, the challenges. We're working on our command climate. We're working on using this is uh, my squad philosophy to get after those conversations, to have um, soldiers and their leaders have much greater interaction and knowledge of backgrounds to make sure that we're treating everyone with dignity and respect and they're all brought in. We've done an extensive effort to retrain um, our lawyers and refresh their capabilities so that they have immediate conversations with all new commanders so that commanders know and understand their responsibilities should these allegations come forward. We've had a lot of retraining and reinvigorating of, of knowledge of dignity and respect across all of our formations, and we will continue to do so. We're taking a hard look at how should our programs be structured? Is there a difference between preventive measures and then response measures? Should these, be, these programs be delivered in different methods? And so we're taking a really hard look at all this 
to help uh, our force uh, turn out with a much better outcome. Thank General, you. General Hawkins. Chairman, uh, shortly after becoming uh, the chief of the National Guard Bureau, we uh, stood up a sexual assault task force because obviously what we've been doing in the past has not made a significant difference. And so we're looking across all 54 states and territories in D.C. to look at those programs that seem to show promise and make sure that we invest in that. And I'm looking forward in June to see the readout from that group. Some of the things that we learned is, is obviously alcohol and bystanders are a factor. We need to address that immediately. Also, the training of our sexual assault response coordinators is making sure we get enough class dates for them so we have trained personnel in all of our organizations. And frankly, sir, as the uh, father of a daughter that serves in the military, this is intolerable and is something we must address at every, every venue. Thank you, General. Admiral? Not surprisingly and very consistently amongst all the reserve chiefs, the elimination of destructive behaviors of every kind is first and foremost on our minds. We also, as General Daniels mentioned, are seeing a reduction in the numbers of sexual assault. We peaked in 2019. We saw a slight decrease in 20 and are on glide slope now to continue that decrease. I agree that the increase in reporting is helpful. We, we've uh, determined now that the culture of excellence uh, umbrella concept is designed to demonstrate what right looks like. So the creation of a culture wherein every sailor can serve in an environment where they're not only safe, but they're encouraged to perform is the outcome we seek. And uh, frankly, where while we see uh, every, uh, the elimination of course is paramount, but every single incidence is one too many. And so we are all driven together. And this is not a Navy Reserve initiative, but a Navy initiative. So our culture of excellence is the umbrella concept. Our Task Force One Navy recently did a deep dive across multi-constituent, multi-stakeholder uh, leadership to determine what is it that we can inculcate at the lowest ranks where we see the pre pre predominance of reporting and of incidents. Um, so, so we continue to look at that from the bottom up as well as from the top down. But I think you'll find consistency amongst all of us in our approach. And General Scobie. Chairman Tester. Chairman Tester, as you can hear. Okay. Chairman Tester, as you can hear from, from my fellow witnesses, we are in lockstep on our way forward. And in fact, we meet on a regular basis to discuss issues just like this. Um, this tears at the fabric of who we are as Department of Defense. And while we continue to make strides in supporting our victims of this scourge, we also recognize that sexual assault is a persistent challenge that we will have to work with together, and it's not easily beaten by any stretch. One of the things we're working with specifically in the Air Force Reserve Command is ensuring we have a climate that does not promote this type of behavior, and we remove opportunity uh, at every chance we get the, 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 the opportunity to do. The other thing is the currency we work in uh, within the Department of Defense is trust. And our airmen, especially if they've been victimized by this, have to trust that we as commanders will do the right thing for them and get them the help that they need. And all these things we're working together to ensure that we're doing for our members. Thank you. I apologize to the committee members for running over, but this is an issue that is, uh, has to be addressed, has to be addressed ASAP. As one of you have already pointed out, even one incident is one too many. Senator Shelby. Thank you. Uh, General Hokuson. I'm concerned about the enduring cost of having National Guard and Reserve troops here on the Capitol grounds. I have two questions. One, what is the impact of those costs to your budget, 2021 budget? And two, at what point do you truly reach a budgetary breaking point if you do not receive resources to backfill those costs? Senator, the cost... Um since January 6th is about $521 million uh, to the National Guard, and we've cash flowed that through our, our pay and allowances and operations and maintenance funds. Uh, we will need that funding back in our accounts by the 1st of August. Um, otherwise, it will impact uh, our drill periods for both in August and September. Uh, in the area of readiness and modernization, uh, General Daniels and General Hoverson, this question. Can you tell us here uh, more about the requirement behind this new model, how it will be resourced, and what overall improvements it will provide for our Guard and Reserve components in the Army? General Daniels, you want to start? So the, re are you, I'm sorry, the, the rearm model, is that? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. So 
Um, what that will do will allow us to do multiple different things. One is to have regional affiliations, habitual relationships with units, and it will also give us additional predictability in terms of how long we're going to be spent during modernization, training, and then mission. So it will allow us to get into a very predictable cycle for our units, and that will help the employers and the families and the service members um, know when they're going to be going off and doing these missions. And, sir, with the National Guard, the, uh, the benefit there is if you look at our state partnership, we're already regionally aligned, and particularly with the Army National Guard, we've uh, taken our eight divisions and actually allocated the uh, subordinate force structure, so there are actually eight full divisions, so that will allow us to, uh, to help deter and also be part of the total Army so that we can uh, align those units and develop long-term training relationships, not only with our state partners, but also in those regions. General Hokuson, what's the, with the recent rise in cyber attacks against the U.S., what's the National Guard's role in defending the homeland from cyber attacks, and how is it working with other federal agencies with similar responsibilities? And finally, does the Guard have the resources it needs for cyber defense, the personnel and everything? Yes, sir. If you look at our cyber forces, we have about five or 4,000 cyber professionals within the National Guard, and that's in 59 units in 40 states. Mm -hmm. We also have what's a, called a defensive cyber element in each state, and we did a year-long study under the uh, a CMAP program, uh, which basically looked at a, a CST type, and what came out of that is we believe that uh, establishing those existing units to be aligned with what Cybercom would utilize, and we would man train and equip them the same, they would provide that capability within each state. Um, if you look over the past year and a half, we had two incidents, both in Louisiana and Texas, where the governors activated their cyber professionals within the National Guard under state active duty to address a cyber attack, uh, one to a school district and another one to a county. And the, uh, using Louisiana as an example, uh, they were able to come in and mitigate the ransomware and save tens of thousands of IT systems, uh, which, as we all know, is something a, a school district could not absorb with their budget. General, the CBO in the area of Space National Guard and Reserve that you mentioned earlier, yes. the CBO has an estimated that an additional $100 million annually will be required to create a Space National Guard and Reserve area, a unit, with a bill up to $490 million annually for a larger Space Guard. Given the level of defense funding proposed by the current administration, how does the National Guard plan to prioritize resources for modernization while also standing up a new service component? So, Can Senator, you do the, it without more resources, sir. The uh, the actual cost is about two hundred thousand dollars, and that's just to change the name tapes on their uniform and the sign outside their buildings and the flags of the units. Uh, the units already exist; they're already performing the mission today. Uh, we don't need any additional MILCON or any additional overstructure. We basically just tape the folks that are doing the mission today, and instead of Air Force, it says Space Force on their name tag the next drill weekend. That's good news, best I've heard in a long time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Senator. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to focus for a minute on January 6th and ask General Hokinson as follows. If we uh, use some 26,000 National Guardsmen, and I thank all of them, their families for their service to our country and sacrifice, as well as others, COVID-19. But if we use some 26,000 uh, to protect this Capitol after the insurrectionist mob overran the Capitol in, on January 6, conversations are ongoing about what to do next. I'm afraid all the prospects are terrible in terms of the access of the public to this building. But uh, I wonder if you are in on those conversations and whether there's a basic question asked as to whether we have to go beyond the National Guard and Reserve and really think of a permanent military presence on Capitol Hill. Senator, in, uh, with respect to that, I was basically, in many cases, just asked to provide force, and so I worked directly with the 54 to make sure that we got the, the personnel that required to get here. And when I did get a chance to read the Task Force 1-6 report, I'm looking back, um, I, I tend to agree with um, the, the number one requirement that there's a lack of number of uh, U.S. Capitol Police officers, which caused their reliance on other agencies. And so 
When I look at this as a guardsman, I see this primarily as a law enforcement issue, and I think it would be a law enforcement solution to that. Uh, obviously, um, until that capability is there, the guard is there to, to do whatever we're asked to do. And uh, currently, sir, the, uh, the 2300 that we have here today are scheduled to end their mission on the 23rd of May, and we are not aware of any requirement beyond that. And so at that time, our, our folks will all go home. Well, I, it really raises a basic practical question. Uh, if the complement of law enforcement is not adequate to the challenge, for instance, the thousands that left the president's rally and came marching up here to uh, crash through the windows and doors and to assault the policemen and that, uh, there was need for uh, supplemental help for sure. Yes, and it took several hours, but they arrived and finally brought the Capitol back under control. I'm just asking whether or not that is something that is a natu naturally a National Guard function or should be a regular military function. Sir, if we look at the uh, our full-time manning within the National Guard, they're basically there to administer and train uh, the part-time force. We don't really have any forces that are there full-time with a dedicated mission set. Um, and so for us to do that, would, it would cause some legislative changes for the National Guard to do that. Okay. Let me ask a follow-up question. At the heart of uh, domestic terrorism in America, according to the FBI and the Attorney General, is uh, white supremacy, racism, white nationalism. We are seeing in those uh, who were arrested and charged with January 6th, yes. veterans of the military, and I think in one instance, at least one, uh, active military who were participating so if the issue of sexual predation should be dominant in our thinking, so too should the issue of racism in the ranks. Yes, sir. What are we doing, what are you doing, uh, to deal with this issue and to make certain that it is not a challenge to the integrity of your unit? Yes, Senator. So we follow very closely the training requirements of both the Army and the Air Force, and frankly, there is no room for extremism of, of any sort within our organization. And so we rely on our, our lower-level commanders and our adjutants general. Um, when they identify personnel that may be uh, susceptible to this, that they either address it within the, uh, the military chain of command or within local law enforcement, whichever is the appropriate means. So let me ask... Uh General, General Bellin, would you like to comment on the same issue? Sir, at this time, we're adequately resourced. We project forward, as you know, the service is in the middle of a force design, and the Commandant has made it very clear that we're looking at reinventing ourselves within the resources we currently have. And uh, and, and so at this point in time, we're not asking for additional resources. No, I'm not, sir, I, I didn't, sir, I'm sorry. I, I was ish, on the issue of race and discriminatory conduct and such. And thanks. Could you comment on what's being done? Yeah, I think, uh, as we talked about before, sexual assault, the first part is acknowledging it. And, uh, and, and I can report to Congress at every level of the Marine Corps, as I engage from second lieutenants in Quantico all the way up to my peers, we are, we are actively acknowledging the problem. And it is not a nice to have, it is not an additional burden for us to solve, it is a primary problem set within the culture of the service. And by talking about that and by signaling at every level that this is the priority, then the natural culture of our service to align, follow orders, and execute priorities kicks into effect. And from, from my experience, the level of candor that goes on in the, in the conversations right now, I've never seen anything like it on any issue. Uh, the acknowledgement, the candor, the sharing of the different uh, underrepresented populations about what their life is like uh, as a minority, for example, or what they perceive on social media and how it contradicts our culture is, uh, is exceptional, is exceptional right now. And that's the beginning. I thank you for that. There, and there have been programs, I won't take any more time of the committee um, this morning, but there have been programs which have suggested that even though we nominally ended racism in the military in the 1940s under President Truman, the reality is much different. And I think that can be said across America in many different venues. Uh, I, I think we have to take a very honest, forthright, and open position on this, that if you're a racist, you have no place in the military. If you're guilty of sexual predation, you have no place in the military. 
I hope that that uh, is clear. Uh, and I'm going to ask each of the branches to respond as I don't want to take any more time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Hokanson, as you indicated, the year 2020 was unprecedented in terms of National Guard activations and deployments. The main guard, for example, has deployed service members to our southern border to assist the overworked and overwhelmed uh, border patrol to Africa to help with security missions to Washington, D.C. to provide support for our Capitol Police, all the while assisting the state of Maine with clinics and logistics and responding to the pandemic. During all of this activity, the Air Guard Wing in Bangor, Maine, continues its extraordinary work refueling our tankers. General, the average age of the Maine National Guard's 10 KC-135s stationed in Bangor is over 60 years old. The maniacs, as they're often called, are pressed into service to operate all over the world, and Bangor is a critical location for flights crossing the Atlantic. Can you provide us with some insight on the roadmap that the Guard and the Air Force are using to recapitalize this aging tanker fleet and ensure that units like Bangor, which are in strategic geographic locations, are able to continue their vital mission long into the future? Yes, Senator. So when we look at the, uh, the recapitalization um, with the KC-46 fleet, um, uh, mobile, the, uh, the next announcements for six and seven, or seven and eight, I apologize, are coming out, I believe, in 23. And so they'll look very closely at each of the mission sets, the locations, and the unit's capability to, to convert. But between now and then, and actually long after that, for the rest of our KC-135 fleet, it's absolutely critical to our nation's defense, um, not only in, in terms of day-to-day -day requirements, but also um, alert requirements as well. And so we're working with the Air Force to make sure we've got a 25-year plan. Um, I think some of these aircraft may be approaching 100 years old, um, but the recapitalization and, and the investment in those airframes is critical so that we can maintain that required capability and capacity for our nation. Well, I would welcome your coming to see the air refueling wing and would be delighted to host you for a visit. I think you'd be very impressed. Yes, ma'am. I'd love to get there. I recently traveled to the southwest border and witnessed the ongoing crisis there. I very much appreciate the work of the Maine Guardsmen and women who have been supporting the Border Patrol in Arizona. I happen to go to Texas. I understand that the Department of Defense has received a request from the Department of Homeland Security to continue supporting these border deployments beyond the end of the fiscal year. What is the status of the planning to extend the Guard's presence into the new fiscal year? So, Senator, we uh, received that uh, request recently. I know it's going through the Office of Secretary of Defense right now to determine how that's going to be resourced going forward um, with the, uh, the rescinding of the Declaration of National Emergency um, a Title X option we're looking at for the Guardsmen to potentially fill that, um, but it may be active component. But they're looking at all options right now, ma'am. Um, but we know the current units that are scheduled there are to come home on the 30th of September. Uh, so we're making sure that we, we do this as quickly as possible to notify those forces so that there's no break in coverage. Given the 20-year high in the number of migrants crossing the border, it is evident that the Border Patrol agents simply, though they work so hard, are overwhelmed and really need assistance. So I hope that will be approved or that active duty forces will assist them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is of you, General Hokanson. 
And I very much appreciate your highlighting the California National Guard's very heroic efforts battling wildfires. Uh, last year alone, four million acres in California burned. 10,000 structures were destroyed, 5,000 of them homes. 31 people lost their lives. So I am very interested in what the Guard can do uh, to be helpful to us. Um, do you have any suggestions that you might care to make? Yes, Senator, thank you for the question. And uh, thankfully, there was a river between one of those fires and my parents' house. Um, wow. But when we look at um, the way we fight forest fires, we've really kind of taken the approach that we've learned from hurricanes. And this March was the first time we actually had a wildland firefighting symposium where we brought all the states together that, that fight forest fires, along with the National Inter Interagency Fire Center, to take a, really a different approach because it's no longer a fire season. We, we start to call it a fire year now. And what we've tried to do is identify, particularly in California, Washington this year, where aviation units may be deploying and identifying states to make sure that they train their air crews so they can fill that gap in case there's a need in California or any of the states uh, that fight wildland firefighting. We're also looking at the ability um, when we look at some of our Title 32 active and guard and reserve personnel, traditionally they are only on for 72 hours under immediate response authority. Um, I'm working on a policy which I should have completed by the end of the month to give adjutants general the ability to retain some of those personnel in an emergency basis um, to help support firefighting because it's absolutely critical our leaders are with them at all times. I note that, first of all, thank you for that answer that some 14% of the Guard members lack health insurance. It's my understanding that while on active duty orders for more than 30 days, Guardsmen are eligible for military medical coverage. However, once their orders end, or if members are activated for less than a month, they have fewer options. Would this be something we might be able to do to be helpful um, and encourage people to remain in the Guard and serve as your Guard serves in California, which is really top of the ladder. Senator, that would be, uh, that's my number one legislative priority, uh, is to get uh, premium free health care for all of our Guardsmen. When we look at the past year and what we asked them to do, particularly we did not know what a COVID environment would be like, we always want the family members and the service member to know that no matter what we ask them to do, because we ask them to be ready at any time, that they're medically ready. And if anything happens, if they're injured or sick before or after their duty, um, that they know that they're going to get the care they need to continue their civilian employment or their military employment. And one of the other things we're concerned of is when you go from orders, sometimes you have to change medical care um, from your civilian provider to, uh, to TRICARE. And in some cases, they'd have to find new medical providers. Um, but by having a standardized process and coverage, they could keep that same health care provider through all of it, which you think is really important. And lastly, ma'am, one of the things we've looked at is when we look at the number of soldiers and airmen that don't have health care coverage, um, if they have access to mental health care or counseling, um, if that might benefit the, uh, the number of suicides that we have in our organization. Well, thank you. I'd be very happy to work with you on that, and I would suspect other members would as well. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the guards, and when these wildfires come to California, we really see with great appreciation their service. So I want you to know that. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for, for being here this morning and, and for your service. Uh, General Hoganson, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, in recent conversations that I've had with uh, Major General Sachs, he's the Alaska TAG, we were discussing the search and rescue mission there in Alaska. In the 176th wing located at Jay Bear, there are three rescue squadrons, you're familiar with them, which utilize the uh, H-60 in, in their operations. Um, we're told that the HH-60s belonging to the 176 have the highest operational tempo in the Air Force and the highest utilization rate. Um, we know that the wing 
need some additional and some upgraded H60s to keep up with the mission demands and to support the growing focus um, the DOD has placed on, on the region, on the Arctic region. Um, the current plan to bed down additional aircraft in Alaska isn't targeted until 2026. And so you've got kind of a misalignment there, if you will, with the growth in mission requirements, the operational requirements, and the aging of the existing helicopters. So can you, can you update me? Um, are there options that exist to allow for perhaps a reprioritization of these assets? And then also, is the utilization rate calculated into the decision-making process? Okay. Yes, Senator. And so, obviously, uh, as a former rescue pilot, I follow the 176 very closely, and they do an incredible amount of rescues and, and make a huge impact every day. And I'm, we'll be working with the Air Force. Um, I'll make sure, number one, that we have no gap in coverage in terms of the number of the aircraft there, but also ask that they take a look based on the operational tempo and the requirements, um, particularly uh, unique to Alaska, especially as the Arctic begins to open more and there may be additional requirements for, for them in that area. I know the future combat rescue helicopter, once that's online, um, our maintenance rates should go up on those. Uh, but between now and then, I think it's 26. I'll continue to work with the Air Force uh, to see if we can get reprioritization or additional aircraft to cover the gap. Well, I appreciate your, your eyes on that and, and the fact that uh, your background um, allows you to be intimately familiar with their mission. I appreciate that. But we are concerned about, about any potential for GAP because what they do and what they provide is extraordinarily unique, and they truly are the best of the best there. Uh, I appreciate uh, your response to, to Senator Shelby here with regards to the, uh, the Space Force. As you know, we currently have members of, of both the Guard and the Reserve in Alaska that are working to, to support uh, the Space Force missions there in Alaska. Uh, I understand that you've given a little bit of background in terms of the CBO score and the cost, but know that we're certainly at the ready to, um, to do what we can to help with that, uh, that very important mission. Uh, another question to you um, relating to, to suicide and mental health issues. This is something that I have paid particular attention to within this subcommittee, making sure that our servicemen and women and their families are, are cared for. Um, we all know that this past year has been tough on everybody, and uh, you, you couple the effects of the pandemic with, with the challenges that you have in certain areas, um, uh, particularly remote assignments like a place um, like, like Alaska. But um, I don't know if you can speak to uh, the statistics within the Guard, whether we've seen an increase in suicides this past year, and then what what more we can be doing to provide those levels of support for mental health and uh, behavioral health issues that may exist within the National Guard. So, Senator, when we looked, uh, we actually watched this very closely over the past year. And at the end of uh, 2020, we were actually just one below our 10-year average. Um, but frankly, anyone is, is devastating, not only to the, to the family, but also to the organization. And I actually stood up... Uh, a suicide prevention task force to take a look at what we're doing across the uh, the entire National Guard. Um, coming into today, we're, we're about five below where we were last year at this time. Um, but once again, any single one of those is, is just devastating impact to the entire organization. One thing that we've done is uh, we've looked at some additional programs and we have 27 pilots that were running pilot programs. We reached out to the 54 states and territories uh, that they brought up as potential uh, benefit to our to our service members. And one I'd like to highlight is called SPRING. It's the Suicide Prevention Readiness Initiative for the National Guard. And what it does is it takes existing data from every county in the United States and identifies potential risk factors. And when they reach a certain level, the adjutants general and the commanders within that state can assess a region based on the things that are taking place within those counties and also hopefully preventively address that and provide additional training 
or counselors within that region to make sure that our service members know that there's, there's opportunities for them to discuss any concerns they might have. Appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I think that's, that's an interesting approach, recognizing that um, oftentimes these, these factors are, are community-based, regionally-based, so I, I look forward to knowing and understanding a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have Senator Schatz virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. I want to continue uh, the line of questioning from Senator Murkowski uh, regarding mental health access and, and suicide prevention. Um, you know, I think there's two issues. One is making sure that uh, Guard members, while uh, being deployed, don't feel stigmatized uh, for, from accessing mental health services. And the other is to the extent that we're making progress in that area in reducing stigma and uh, encouraging everybody across our society to understand that mental health is just health and that uh, every guard member ought to access those services. I worry a bit about the transition from from uh, deployment to regular life when they have access to all these great services and, and programs and initiatives that you've uh, uh, started up and then they're back to their regular life and may need continuing mental health services and that transition can be challenging. So could you speak to both issues, the, the stigma issue, and then how do we transition when someone's uh, coming out of their deployment? Yes, Senator. So when we look at the uh, the day-to-day, -day, the, the stigmatism related to that, um, when folks come off deployment, uh, they have the opportunity uh, to meet with medical professionals on their way out, um, and they can request help, and they can also be aware of the services available to them. And that extends for about six months post-deployment. Also, they do a periodic health assessment, which allows them to go online and fill out a lot of questions. And having recently done it, they ask a lot of questions if they have any mental health concerns, if they'd like to see someone, and they can do that um, really anonymously. Now, with respect to the, to the enduring concern, uh, this really goes back to my, my number one priority legislatively, and, and that is to pursue uh, TRICARE Reserve Select for all of our guardsmen, um, where they don't pay for any... Uh, any principle related to that. The key there is that way that's always available to them um, because you never know when you're going to need it because your life situation could change at any time. But knowing that they can uh, get mental health care or see a counselor, I think is something that, uh, that we don't know the benefits of, but I, I believe it certainly will help. Thank you, General. And you certainly have my support for, for that very important uh, legislative initiative. Uh, moving on uh, to the Asia Pacific region, you know, when I talk to Indo PACOM commanders or uh, ambassadors in the in the region, everybody loves the state partnership program. So I'm wondering if you could just help us to understand um, how we can use the state partnership uh, program to support Indo PACOM specific deterrence initiative. Yes, sir. So when you look at the uh, the National Guard, so we're 20 percent of the entire joint force. And specifically to the Indo-PACOM region, we have 13 state partnerships. Um, in fact, as the Adjutant General of Oregon, I had state partnerships with both Bangladesh and, and Vietnam. And the great asset that it provides to the Indo-PACOM commander is we're fully integrated into their theater security cooperation plan. And these enduring relationships that we build with these countries also is an additional U.S. presence, um, but also gives us many times the opportunity to to counter some of the messaging that they receive from China and, and other countries. So I think it's absolutely critical we continue that, and we're in close coordination with Indo-PACOM um, to help in any way we can with their Pacific Defense Initiative. Uh, one final question is, is uh, you know, we lost some time, obviously, during COVID, as everybody did, um, with partners, and just wondering what, how we're specifically focusing on relationships that were maybe um, tenuous, but being built, um, and then COVID interrupted that relationship building um, in the in the context of the of the state partnership program. Are there particular countries that we're sort of anxious to get um, uh, moving again uh, 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 in terms of our partnerships with? Hey, yes, Senator, and in fact, I would say we're we're pretty anxious to get back with all of them as quickly as we can. Uh, the one thing that was nice is I think if, on both of our parts, our part and uh, our state partners, we realized the the limitations we had in terms of travel. And so we were able to find virtual ways to connect with them, uh, continue our relationships. Um, we're very much looking forward to the ability to travel to all of our state partners as soon as possible um, to continue to, uh, to develop those relationships. Thank you. And um, uh, 
on energy resilience, I just wanted to flag that the president, as you know, issued an executive order establishing a, a federal clean energy standard. This may not uh, have immediately, you know, risen to, to your desk, uh, but I'm going to submit a question for the record about the particular ways in which you're going to have to change your procurement process in, in order to comply with the president's uh, executive order. But I'll, I'll submit that uh, to you uh, for a response for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The senior senator from Kansas, Senator Moran. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that uh, recognition. Uh, assuming that it has nothing to do with age, I appreciate it. General Hokinson, uh, there's a pilot program that was authorized in NDAA, in the, in the FY21 NDAA, that uh, would allow the testing and development uh, of National Guard partnerships across state lines in regard to cybersecurity. Uh, the opportunity was for the private sector to participate uh, in one state, the, the uh, National Guard in that state, then be able to assist other National Guards in another state uh, in regard to training, preparation, and response to a cyber secure uh, attack. Um, I don't think it's necessary to say, but something that's hugely important and front and center for all of us. Uh, as you know, I think the Kansas National Guard is home to some of our nation's uh, best cyber security operators. And we also have a number of uh, civilian uh, stakeholders who are interested in, in assisting in that mission. So that pilot program has been authorized. My question is, if we provide you with proper uh, funding, uh, is the DOD prepared to per pursue, make the assessments, tell us what, uh, how that program might work, and do you foresee any roadblocks that would prevent the mission that uh, is contemplated by this pilot program from being accomplished? Yes, sir. So I'm looking forward to seeing the, the end results of that. Um, but what we've done internally is, is take a look at that as well. And I, I really look at cyber like in many ways like a hurricane. So we ask we need additional truck companies come down there. Um, and the same with cyber. If we need additional cyber help through the EMAC process, we can move them state to state to provide that capability. And in some cases, they don't even need to move. They can operate from their current location. Um, so that's very important. But I think, to your point, a lot of our relationships with the, uh, the civilian providers or companies that have, you know, exquisite experience and many of our guardsmen work for them and they bring that to their, to their cyber jobs is absolutely critical. But when we look at the fact that we're literally, you know, at war every day on the cyber battlefield, it's important that our guardsmen are, are trained and up to date and they can respond wherever they're needed within their communities. Um, and that's where we look at the state active duty capabilities under the authority of the governors to address issues within their state or request from help from outside the state. Uh, General, in, in my words, I would say that you're telling me, telling the committee that uh, this has value uh, and it in part may be accomplished uh, regardless of the outcome of the pilot program uh, with the active participation of you and, and those on your team to accomplish it. Is that a fair assessment of that, yes, your, your response? Uh, and no, you know of no roadblocks that I need to be pursuing to, to, to remove? It, sir, not at this time. We'll have to work specific to each of the states because some of them have different uh, laws that have to be followed. But we work very closely with the 54 to look at overarching policies that we can put across the entire organization to facilitate the need to address any issues within our communities. Also, thank you for recognizing the, what, what really takes place in Wichita with our red team uh, in the private sector who employs those guard members. Sure. And then that gives them the capability to devote significant attention and expertise to uh, national security matters. Uh, I appreciate you knowing that. Let me ask all our witnesses, DD-214 reform, one of the things what we're trying to overcome is the tremendous burden that uh, members of the military and their families encounter when they uh, leave the service. Uh, and um, I, my goal is to make it simple for National Guard and Reserve members to keep track of their records of deployment. And my question is, would you support, do you support providing a comprehensive document um, of military service for the reserve component similar to the DD-214? I'll, I'll say absolutely, yes, sir. We would very much welcome that so that it's um, easier for members once they've served to, to show that, that they have served and it's a universally accepted document. Does General Daniels uh, receive any uh, criticism or uh, disagreement from any of her colleagues? Uh, let the record show that all are in agreement. Uh, my final question in my last 46 seconds, uh, the Moms Leave Act. Last year, a, a bill that I author, uh, authored 
uh, authorized maternity leave for mothers in the reserve component. Uh, that bill was signed into law. Women in the Guard and Reserve across the United States are waiting for the department to implement this law so that they receive comparable support to their active duty counterparts. Does the department require any clarifying language? Are there any challenges in getting this implemented so that uh, those mothers, uh, mothers-to-be and mothers that are currently in that circumstance can receive the benefits of this legislation? Mr. Senator, I would say I'd, we're working very closely with OSD on implementation guidance, and we think this is absolutely the right thing to do for our reservists to be treated exactly like their active counterparts. And it's an acknowledgement um, that we need to recognize their service and adjust accordingly. Could I, I mean, anyone else have a response? Senator Moran, it's uh, Rich Scobie here at the end of the table from the Air Force Reserve. Uh, we are in lockstep with what General Hokinson just uh, talked about. In fact, the Reserve Chiefs met last week to discuss this very issue. And so as the department determines how this is going to be fleshed out across the board, uh, that they are working hard with our elected officials to ensure that we get this act. Any barrier that we have to anybody being able to serve within our commands is extremely important that we uh, get through, and that's what we're working on. Thank you. General Daniels. Daniels. As stated, we, we did talk just like three days ago about this very matter. So this is high on our, our list of, of implementation actions. Thank you. It might be hypocritical for me to complain about the length of time it's taking for implementation because it took a significant amount of time to get it passed through Congress. But it is important and timeliness does matter. Uh, thank you all. Senator Shaheen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for your service to this country and for your testimony this morning. Uh, General Hokinson, I want to begin with you, because, and actually I should say, I should start by echoing the remarks of the Chairman and so many of my colleagues with thanks to the Guard for all of their extraordinary efforts over the last year as we have battled COVID in New Hampshire. We could not have done it without the National Guard, and they have been on consistent deployment now for over 400 days. So I, I think it's imperative for all of us to thank everyone for what they have done. It has made a huge difference. So thank you very much. I, I want to go back to Senator Collins' um, questions about the KC-135s, because as you're aware, um, the 157th Air Refueling Wing at Pease was the first National Guard base to get the KC-46s, and we were so excited about that. We said goodbye to our last KC-135 with the anticipation that we would get those 46s, and they have come in, and now we're the first Guard base to get all of our component of the tankers, and we can't use them. And it's really frustrating, and I know you all share in that frustration. But there were serious concerns voiced last year about the retirement of our legacy tankers because of the delays in getting the KC-46s operational. And in fact, in the FY21 NDAA, we restricted divestment of the KC-10 and KC-135s. Now, I understand that the president's budget has been released, um, or at least the outline, and it states that retiring legacy systems should be a priority for the defense budget this year. Do you agree with that position? And perhaps I should ask um, yeah. General um, from... Yes, Senator, so when I look at the... Um, obviously, we do need to modernize, um, but we also must retain the capability and capacity that our nation needs. So in some cases, although we have legacy systems, until they're modernized, I think it's important that we continue to retain, like the KC-135, to meet all the requirements of our nation. General Scobie, do you agree with that? Senator Shaheen, I appreciate that question very much. Um, it is vital that the Air Force is able to project power across the world. Uh, the KC-46 is the linchpin in that. As General Hokinson said, he's exactly right. We are trying to balance the new equipment we bring in with modernizing the KC-135, and those two airframes are going to be what take us into the future. Um, having had the opportunity to fly the KC-46, um, two things I was able to take from that. One is I'm not as good of a pilot as I used to be, and the other thing is, is that it's an incredibly capable machine. And I know that uh, General Van Ovos at AMC is going to make sure that we get all the capabilities out of that we can. And it is also fielding the Air Force Reserve now. So my confidence is high. We are on the right path forward. Well, thank you. I've had a chance to 
fly on it as well as a passenger and was very impressed with the potential. And I guess that adds to the frustration around it. Now I understand that um, the 46s would be able to perform other missions and particularly aeromedical missions are, are on that list and that makes our guard in New Hampshire very excited. But one of the challenges to actually doing those missions is a new problem that's come up and we don't talk about that as much as we do the remote vision systems but the air transportable galley lavatories, basically the bathrooms, the ATGLs are now a problem that I guess we're going to have trouble flying some of those missions until that gets fixed. Do you have any sense, General Hokanson, when that's going to happen and what I can tell the 157th in New Hampshire about when they might be able to fly those missions? Ma'am, I do not, but we can uh, certainly get back to you on the exact dates um, until that's resolved. But. Thank you. Um, also a question for Boeing as we see this come up when we didn't realize we thought we had na um, nailed down the other issues with the tanker and this has become a new problem. So thank you. I, I would appreciate knowing more about that. And, and I have a final question for you, General Hokanson, because one of the challenges that, um, and I guess, General Davies, this is a, a concern for you as well. One of the challenges our Guard has in New Hampshire is with the age of some of our facilities. They are decades old, and replacing those has been costly. The state doesn't have the, the funds to do that at this point. So can you talk about how important it is for us to replace some of those facilities so that our Guard and Reserve are prepared when they're called up? Yes, Senator. If you look within the National Guard, 26% of our facilities are over 60 years old. And I know I've worked with General Michaelitis on the, uh, so the state not having to have a match, especially during the COVID environment. Uh, but it's absolutely critical. And this really goes back to the climate. If you look at how inefficient so many of our facilities are and everything that we build new or replace, we make sure it's modernized and it's more efficient so it reduces the, the energy draw for those. But also if you look at the armories, these were built in the 50s and 60s and back then an infantry could, infantryman could put everything in a wall locker. And that's not the case anymore. Uh, there's significant uh, equipment requirements and security requirements. Um, so any additional funding we can get, um, we always put to good use. Thank you, do you wanna to add to that, General? We're in a very similar situation. Um, we're, we're funded at about 86% um, of our requirements, and we continue to do the best we can with the resources that we've got, and we continue to look for modernization and efficiencies wherever possible. Thank you both. Um, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time, but I would suggest that as we're thinking about any infrastructure package, thinking about how we can support our guard around the country would be an important piece of that. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, General Hokanson, thank you for visiting with me earlier. Appreciate it. Um, and I want to begin by talking about the MQ-1C Gray Eagle. That's an, uh, an important uh, part of the uh, important equipment for active duty Army. Matter of fact, the Gray Eagle, um, they operated across all of their combat aviation uh, brigades. And so given uh, that uh, the... Army National Guard is expected to deploy and fight alongside the active duty counterparts. Uh, it seems to me to be very important that you have that, the Gray Eagle as well uh, for your soldiers and uh, that you are trained on it. And so I would uh, ask uh, your opinion and do you support um, fielding the uh, MQ-1C uh, Gray Eagle uh, for the Army National Guard? Yes, sir, Ed. Now, when we look at the, uh, the Army National Guard Division, so there's 10 active duty divisions, and we're now forming the eight National Guard Divisions, and that capability currently resides in the Combat Aviation Brigades on active duty. And I want to make sure that our National Guard is equipped and looks just like the active component. So if they have Gray Eagles in their Combat Aviation Brigades, I would strongly advocate for the same capability within the National Guard so that our units are interoperable and we have the same capabilities in each of our divisions. So what steps need to be taken to accomplish that? So I believe uh, the Army would need to be resourced um, because as we brought the eight additional Guard divisions on, um, those capabilities like Devartis and other organizations are being stood up in the National Guard right now. 
so that we have the same and look the same. Also, uh, I want to ask about the uh, MQ-9 uh, Reaper. Our Air Guard flies that, the Happy Hooligans in Fargo, and they have, they were one of the very first Guard units to get the, uh, yes, that mission. Uh, originally Predator, now yeah. Reaper, and they've been flying it continuously ever since. Um, we're building a new operations facility, which is good, but we're flying the Block 1 mm -hmm. uh, MQ-9, and we need to get to the Block 5. And so we work to fund, uh, to authorize and fund 16 of the uh, new aircraft uh, for this fiscal year. We'll continue to work to do that. Uh, but I, I would like, uh, you know, your uh, assurances that, that for Guard units like ours that they uh, will transition in a timely way from the Block 1 to the Block 5. It, yes, sir, and uh, I believe they're scheduled to convert in 24, about the same time as the facilities will be completed. And obviously, sir, if there's any opportunity to speed that up, we'll work with the Air Force to do that. Uh, but I know currently the plan is in FY24. Appreciate that. Uh, my next, uh, I guess, question, it relates to uh, tuition assistant, huge uh, tool for recruiting and retention for the Guard and all reserve units. Uh, is the making sure that the educational benefit is there, both the federal tuition assistance and the GI Bill educational benefit. And I had put in legislation with Senator Pat Leahy to make sure that the Guard and all reserve components can use both because you need it for recruitment to get these... I mean, your business is a high-tech business that calls for certainly capable people physically but they have to be super sharp now uh, in terms of using all the technology, uh, you know, to, to stay ahead of our adversaries. So um, our legislation would make sure that all reserve guard and all reserve components could use both. Now, good news is that the DOD has said, yes, we're going to do that. So tell me, where are we in getting that done and getting it out to our, our soldiers, our men and women in uniform? Yes, sir. So within the uh, the Army National Guard, we've, we've got it out, and we've had that capability previously. Uh, within the Air National Guard, we've had to fund that, and currently we have 14 states that are doing that. But based on the success of that program, we are now funding within the National Air National Guard eight additional states every year until we get all 54. But, sir, as you mentioned, it's an incredible benefit to our, our Guardsmen. It, it really is. And I would welcome uh, comments from any of the others on that. And the TRICARE Reserve Select benefit is something that we have to have out there for Guard and Reserve as well, starting with you, General Holkinson, and then uh, General Sco uh, Scobie and anyone else that wants to weigh in on either of those, that educational or health care benefit. Yes, sir. As I mentioned, that's my number one legislative priority. It's a benefit not only just to the medical readiness of the organization, um, but to the family members, and also it's a benefit to the employer knowing that if they employ a guardsman, they have their own health care. And also we talked about uh, potentially benefits when it comes to suicide prevention by having uh, mental health readily available as, also, as well as counseling. General Scobie. Senator Haven. Uh, exactly right. Uh, General Hokinson has, has explained it uh, correctly. From uh, and I, I will really tell you from a reserve perspective, this is a new benefit that we have on the education piece, and we're very thankful that you started that, and that it, the Department of Defense has, has followed through with with what we wanted for our airmen. Uh, the our airmen now are so so much better than they were in the past with as far as education, high tech, and the things that we've been able to do over the last few decades. Uh, we really need these benefits because it attracts and retains the airmen that we need. And then as you talked about TRICARE Reserve Select, uh, we are extremely thankful for that benefit. Um, right now it's scheduled to take place in 2030. We'd like to move that up uh, sooner if able. But the, the ability for our airmen not to have uh, lapses in coverage uh, is exactly what we've been talking about up here as a group, is to ensure that we have the all the all the medical benefits that, that should be allowed for our members to use, especially when it comes to mental illness or anything that would happen to them and when they are activated. Thank you. Yeah, I know I'm over my time, Mr. Chairman. Just any other thoughts that... Uh, yeah, Senator, I'd offer uh, just a slightly different perspective. <clears throat> I think all of these benefits are welcomed by all the service chiefs, and they're, they're of great use and utility to our force, our future force. The problem becomes, when it, if you look in the lens of future resourcing, our obligation is to train these young warriors to be prepared for the next fight. 
And if we push all of our resourcing into education and health benefits, which are exceptional, where are we aggregating risk if we're cutting into the resources that we really have to use, which is preparing them for war? There's a fine balance here. If there's one pie to slice from, we have to look at where we're taking those slices from and then consider the actual risk to the human beings that we're trusted to safeguard. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Baldwin, virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, General Hilkinson, as we discussed recently, I wrote to the DOD Inspector General late last year concerned that not all Guard members were protected as whistleblowers due to the Inspector General's interpretation of military whistleblower protection statutes. Uh, the IG wrote back last month saying that it would begin expanding whistleblower protections to Guard members operating under Title 32 status. This is a welcome update, but I really believe that all members of the Guard should be protected regardless of duty status. Further, I do not believe it was Congress's intent in passing uh, military whistleblower protections to have these protections be dependent on a specific duty status instead of simply tied to being a member of the armed forces in general. In Wisconsin, because of brave whistleblowers, the National Guard Bureau's Office of Complex Investigations uncovered a history of reprisal, retaliation, and command-initiated investigations that were out of line with DOD sexual assault prevention policy. Um, we have to ensure that these types of whistleblowers are protected from reprisal. So can you discuss the importance of ensuring that whistleblower protections include all guard personnel? And do you support a change in definition of, quote, member of the armed forces uh, that would ensure whistleblower protections for all members of the guard? Yes, Senator. So when we look at the, uh, the intent of that policy, um, our key is to work with the 54 adjutants general in their states um, to make sure that, that they follow the intent of that policy unique to their state. And so we will look very closely with them and work with the adjutants general um, as those that would implement that to make sure that we have a, a policy that covers um, all of our Guard members um, based on their service. Thank you. Um, General Hawkinson, can you explain a little about how the Office of Complex Investigations works? For example, how are cases assigned, how are investigators trained, and how does OCI decide which sexual assault cases it investigates? Yes, Senator, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. So when we look at our Office of Complex Investigations, because 95% of what we do operates in the, uh, the Title 32 or in a state status, um, the majority of the time we're not under Title 10. And so we rely on our local law enforcement and local prosecutors um, to address um, serious events, specifically uh, sexual assault. And in cases where they, the local law enforcement may not take the case, uh, we had created an administrative review um, under our Office of Complex Investigation. In that case, the, uh, the victim or the adjutant general can ask for the OCI to come into their state and conduct an investigation, administrative, and make recommendations to the chain of command. And so what that allows us to do is to take a look at some cases that may not be accepted or may not meet the criteria of local law enforcement, and it gives us an avenue to, uh, to address those issues. When we look at where we are today, traditionally we had about 18 to 24. Uh, shortly after becoming uh, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, I reached out to the 54. We were able to get 32 um, trained investigators right now. We also separated it from our general counsel and is an independently and is now led by a, a general officer with a legal background in his civilian career who uh, General Walker is doing some incredible work making sure that we, we look at all of the new cases, but also the backlogs. And the key is we're trying to get the older ones done as quickly as possible uh, so that we can get current and reduce the time frame from when it's reported until that adjutant general receives a completed report. Um, does the Office of Complex Investigations have enough investigators to investigate every case sent to it uh, from the states at the current uh, staffing level? Um, Senator, we could always use more resources. 
Um, for us, it's finding qualified personnel uh, across the organization that have the time to do this or could leave their civilian career to do this. So we could obviously always use more, um, but it's a, it's a fine line between that and those capable to do it that are volunteering to do it. Yeah. How many investigators would the Office of Complex Investigations need to uh, keep current um, and, and what, uh, what funding or other assistance from Congress um, could help you get there? So, Senator, I know we have 32 today, and General Walker recently came on board. He's doing a complete review of the entire organization. So if you don't mind, I would prefer to get back to you directly from him, because I know he's looking at the caseload and the number of folks he would need and the exact resources. I appreciate that, and we'll look forward to that information. Let me um, add on to that. What would the National Guard Bureau require in order to have the Office of Complex Investigations do, say, top-down reviews for each guard unit um, on a rotational basis or as a matter of routine in order to ensure that their sexual assault policies are in line with federal law? Yes, Senator, I'll, I'll defer to General Walker and I'll get his specifics there, but I know this is something that we work with our 54 adjutants general um, to make sure that they're following the policies um, directed by each of the services and that they meet those requirements and that we, we review them to make sure that, that they have the personnel assigned to the areas where they're supposed to be and also to make sure they're trained. And one thing this has brought up is the, uh, the availability of school seats. Also, the unique environment the National Guardsmen operate in since 95% of our time is in a Title 32 status. And so we're actually right now exploring uh, the potential of creating our own schoolhouse to really take the best of what the Army and the Air Force does, but also train to the unique environment the National Guard operates in. Thank you, Appreciate Senator that. Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Senator Bowman. Uh, Senator Bozeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. I also want to echo the great job that the Guard and Reserve did during COVID. Just last week, the Arkansas National Guard concluded its 13-month mission to help distribute roughly 56 million pieces of PPE to our communities and medical facilities. I think that just illustrates what went on all over the country. So be sure and pat yourselves on the back and uh, all of those that uh, have worked so, so very hard. Lieutenant General Daniels, I enjoyed our recent conversation hearing about your efforts to recruit and retain soldiers. The Army Reserve contains a significant amount of the Army's medical capabilities with many of your soldiers having civilian careers in various medical fields. Can you walk us through your efforts with the Ur Urban Augmentation Medical Task Forces and the role they are designed to play in combating COVID-19? Thank you, Senator. We took a paper that had been written and within 48 hours created these urban augmentation medical task force of 85 medical professionals. And within two weeks, we're then putting them up into um, the Northeast cities and, and places where those hospitals were under great stress to help provide some relief. We were very careful and cautious where we pulled these individuals from so they were not hurting their local communities, but were in a place that they could go afford and provide assistance to others. We deployed 15 of those very early on, and then later during the COVID response, we put another three out to the West Coast, and we had another four on standby. No, that's a great story, and uh, in normal times, that 48 hours would take months and months and months, maybe years. So thank you for uh, your leadership, and, and again, you know, making things happen. General Hokinson, in your written, written testimony, you spoke about providing the necessary forces to meet joint uh, force mission. You mentioned several guard units that deploy overseas and the extensive training that is necessary for them to go. Locations such as Fort Chaffee in Arkansas have the capabilities to, to provide first class alternate locations for units to train to meet the growing demand of joint force. I guess the question is, can you comment on the current readiness of the National Guard and do you have the necessary capacity needed to train those forces? Yes, Senator. So when we look at the current readiness, um, even despite the COVID environment, we met every single one of our overseas deployment requirements, and also we met every requirement from our governors. 
However, that did have an impact on us, um, particularly when you look at recruiting, the inability to, to meet face to face like we previously had has caused a lot of innovative ways to, to get at recruiting and retention and also at training. Now you train virtually and now we're to the point where, you know, with uh, maintaining social distancing and all the other requirements, we're able to continue our training. And also, in fact, it was the National Guard's first of the 34th Armored Brigade Combat Team was the first one to go through a combat training center rotation in a COVID environment. Uh, but sir, aside from that, when we look at Fort Chaffee and a lot of our other training areas, it's absolutely critical that we maintain those so that we have the ability to train our guardsmen within their states or nearby, um, because the amount of uh, training space that we have and ranges um, is continually getting encroached upon. Right. So it's important for us to retain every single one of those. Mm -hmm. Very good. General, in your written testimony, you stated the National Guard is a lethal, cost-effective, dual-role operational force that provides strategic depth to the Army, Air Force, and Space Force and responds to crisis in our homeland. Some estimates put that cost-effectiveness of the Guard at 30 cents on the dollar. Knowing that, would you say that the Guard funding requests from the services have been adequate over the years? And then also, how critical is the National Guard and Reserve equipment account funding to the uh, continued operations of the Guard, particularly in domestic missions, supporting the homeland? So, sir, uh, related to the last question with uh, Negria, the equipment account, it's absolutely critical to the modernization of the National Guard and I think all of our reserve components. Um, our services don't always have enough funding to modernize the entire organization, and so that allows us to, to help supplement that. But also when we look at a lot of the critical dual use capabilities, um, like I'll just use fire buckets as an example to fight forest fires, um, that allows us to do that, um, to purchase that equipment and maintain it um, in case our communities ever need it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. Uh, we appreciate all your testimony here today. Uh, senators may submit additional written questions and we ask you if you receive those to respond to those in a reasonable period of time. The next defense subcommittee uh, uh, will reconvene on Wednesday, May 26 at 10 a.m. for a closed hearing on Intelligence Committee on the housekeeping front. Uh, the hearing after the next one, because it will be uh, in a closed hearing, so this won't apply. But uh, uh, we, will ask, we will ask questions on this committee based on seniority and who is physically present. After those questions have been asked, then we'll go off of seniority virtually. Um, so that's a little change in process, but we've got some uh, uh, direction from the CDC now that I think will help encourage folks to be here in person. So with that, thank you all very much, and this committee is adjourned.